All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, good afternoon to you all. My name is Dan Stackhouse. I'm the Director of Development for the Library of Virginia Foundation. Um, and I am very proud to welcome you all here today to the Library of Virginia, um, especially as I am a Richmond College man, so it's um, good to have that around here today. Um, I'm curious if there's a, are there any of you here who are here at the Library of Virginia for the very first time? Ever been to the Wonderful. We're proud to welcome you to uh, our book talk series um, where we offer the best and brightest of Virginia authors and authors writing on Virginia topics. So these happen two, three times a month. It's a great way to come spend a lunchtime and uh, learn a little bit, be entertained. So I hope you all will, uh, will come back and join us. I hope you had an opportunity to sign up. We are giving away a copy of uh, Dr. Hyman's book today. We'll be doing that at the end. So um, if you didn't have a chance, we'll, uh, we'll get you a card and get you a chance to sign up. Um, as I mentioned, I'm with the Library Foundation. We are a private 501c3 nonprofit that supports the efforts of the library. We, uh, we make, our, uh, make our niche in trying to carve out uh, elements of education, uh, outreach programming, uh, conservation, restoration, things like that. Things that the state either can, can't or sometimes chooses not to, not to do. Um, and we do that with support of both the, found, the uh, foundation support, corporate support, and support from individuals just like you. So um, if I can share with you any information about how you can become a member of the Semper Virginia Society, which is our giving society here at the library, please, please see me. Um, one more, I think one more housekeeping item. We'll be doing a, a book signing afterward right out in the lobby. Um, so if you weren't one of the lucky people to win a book, we will have them for sale. Um, and uh, you'll be able to get Dr. Howman's report. Well, it's all five. I better not speak. Um, it's going to do well with that. that that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe the shorter the better, then we'll sell a few more books. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. David Burhans. He is the uh, Chaplain Emeritus of the University of Richmond, and he will introduce our guest of honor. Thank you, Dan. So this is a glorious time for the University of Richmond, with Dan uh, in charge of this program this afternoon. Congratulations to you, Dan, and your work here at uh, the Library of Virginia. Um, it is a distinct privilege uh, to present to you Dr. E. Bruce Holland. He insisted I not introduce him, but present him. I'm not sure what the distinction is, but what I do want to say to you is this gentleman uh, has been associated in a leadership position at the University of Richmond for 38 years. 17 of those years as president of the university and 21 of those years as chancellor. He provided leadership at the university at a most critical juncture in the university's 177 year history when he started in 1971 and uh, we are still on the move and with high momentum thanks to uh, the Robbins family and other grand uh, supporters and Dr. Highland's leadership. The man of uh, integrity, uh, high energy, a positive spirit. He's a little difficult to keep up with, but uh, we enjoy watching him and hearing about what he's doing. He's a graduate of Campbellville University in Kentucky, Vanderbilt University, uh, a member of the United States Marine Corps, a member of boards and foundations uh, in a number of places. And you may learn about some of this in, in his book, um, which we would encourage you, of course, to purchase. Um, and I do want to say about him that uh, uh, <coughs> since he invited me to be the first chaplain at the University of Richmond, um, I'm grateful to him uh, and to all of those who made possible uh, moral and spiritual leadership at the university. It's been a great journey for me. But this gentleman uh, not only has been a significant leader, uh, but he uh, has distinguished himself in recent years um, by the five children uh, that are his and Betty's and the 11 grandchildren who will continue to carry on the Howland tradition. Um, I guess his greatest claim to fame at 82 years of age now is that he rode his Harley Davidson cross country. Uh, this man has something to say. He's got a lot to do, so you don't want to keep him too long. Bruce Holland.
man stood at the pearly gates, his face was scarred and old. He stood before the gate of faith for admission to the fold. What have you done, St. Peter asked, to gain admission here? I've been a college president, sir, for many and many a year. The pearly gates swung open wide, St. Peter touched the bell. Come in, he said, and choose your harp. You've had your time in hell. Fairbanks <laughs> <laughs> McIntyre, Mika Hobbs, members of the library staff in charge of these programs, David Burhans, and the young man, the Richmond graduate, who was just up here introduced David Burhans, whom I just meant to know, and the others that uh, honor me by their presence, including David Burhans, who I did employ, and I'm proud of it. It is indeed uplifting to share my life story with acquaintances and strangers for whatever reason you may have chosen to spend your lunch hour absorbing my review of the contents of my book, an interruption that lasted a lifetime. Several present are mentioned in our relationship and they're chronicled in the pages of these memoirs and if I told you who they were, you wouldn't read the book to find out. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. Their names, pictures, and otherwise are in the book. Haven't taken me 82 years to write the 600 pages of 80 years of experience. I'm inclined to read it to you from cover to cover. <laughs> I will try to boil it down to sort of consistency, as we would say in Kentucky some of what these 80 years entail. Over the years, colleagues, friends, and family have been struck by the unique or at least unusual circumstances of my life. Often they've said, you need to write this down. So five or so years ago, I began seriously considering the options and bit by bit it evolved until today I have a book which I hope many will enjoy as an experience of one person representative of many who have lived that period of 80 years from 1926 through today. Mine is the story of a generation called by Tom Brokaw, the greatest generation. While that may not be applicable in all respects, it does connote the challenges faced by those born in the early part of the 20th century who lived through the Great Depression, followed by the greatest world conflict of all time. From these and other maturing occurrences were developed the capacity and determination to build the industrial, technical, financial, physical, spiritual, and leadership resources essential to advance in the nation beyond anything thought possible before that time. Initially, I intended to preserve some aspects of my life for my family and its descendants, but the more I recorded my thoughts, the more obvious it became that my story was representative of many others of my era. Thus, I could catalog a bit of the history by recounting paralleling events of theirs and between mine. Thus my story is just one example of how millions were affected by similar circumstances that led to broader perspectives which allowed many to engage in roles never before envisioned. Most who know me today identify me with the activity in which I've been engaged for more than 55 years, college and university administration, 21 years of which involved the presidency. Yet my life has been greatly affected by the experiences of growing up in a rural area of Kentucky as the educationally deficient son of a tenant farmer in the advent of World War II, which led to my four years of service in the United States Marine Corps. I have recently written an article to be published in the magazine of the Naval Institute next month, I believe. The Marine Corps taught me what now means. It is, reveals the fact that when I entered the Marine Corps, I lacked adequate credit for a high school diploma, but that the discipline and high expectation of the Marine Corps changed my lackadaisical attitude by demanding that when I was ordered to do something, I must do it now. <laughs> Thus, adulthood for me came to fruition in a manner directly related to changes wrought there. The title of my book, An Interruption That Lasted a Lifetime, reflects the transforming nature of the Marine Corps experiences, for I can say with certainty, without them, I would have likely continued the apathetic pathway of my teenage years. But with them, I will became more important in my successes than IQ. From that Marine Corps experience, I gleaned the meaning of the words of Thomas Carlyle. Our main business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. At age 82, I still remember what now means. And as a result, while I was still able, I recently completed a 3,000-mile motorcycle adventure from Virginia to California, deciding that later may be too late, so I did it now. 
Clearly, the years of my life span a historically significant and dramatically transforming period. The world today is quite a different place from the one I entered 82 years ago, and thus that which was in my youth quite ordinary 82 years to write the 600 pages of 80 years of experience, I'm inclined to read it to you from cover to cover. However, <laughs> I will try to boil it down to sort of consistency, as we would say in Kentucky, some of what these 80 years entail. Over the years, colleagues, friends, and family have been struck by the unique or at least unusual circumstances of my life. Often they've said, you need to write this down. So five or so years ago, I began seriously considering the options and bit by bit it evolved until today I have a book which I hope many will enjoy as an experience of one person representative of many who have lived that period of 80 years from 1926 through today. Mine is the story of a generation called by Tom Brokaw, the greatest generation. While that may not be applicable in all respects, it does connote at age 82, I still remember what now means. And as a result, while I was still able, I recently completed a 3,000 mile motorcycle adventure from Virginia to California, deciding that later may be too late, so I did it now. <laughs> Clearly, the years of my life span a historically significant and dramatically transforming period. The world today is quite a different place from the one I entered 82 years ago, and thus that which was in my youth quite ordinary would be viewed today as unusual to say the least. I was born on a farm in Smithfield, Kentucky in Henry County. My father was working for an uncle because he was unable to make a living on his mother-in-law's farm on Booty Lane, which in those days could have well been named Muddy Lane. In my book, I cite a birthday card from my father 65 years later, from which I quote, I remember very well the day you were born. I was shocking hay in the field next to the house where we lived. It's hard for me to realize that you're a senior citizen. In 1926, when I was born, life expectancy in the United States was 54 years as compared to 77 today. Only 6% of youngsters graduate from high school and a mere 1% completed college. Today, 83% graduate from high school and 27% from college. The Great Depression engulfed the country with a stock market crash in 29. Thus, my father, as were others like him, was financially distressed with barely enough to feed his family of seven with $30 a month. But that was not his first experience with economic and personal insolvency. When my dad was 12 years old, his father, unable to pay the mortgage on his farm because of the low farm prices, hung himself in the tobacco barn, following which dad quit school to support his mother and three younger children. At the height of the Depression in 1932, 273,000 families were evicted from their homes. Way of Manchester in The Glory and the Dream wrote, poverty was considered shameful. One could never be sure about the smartly dressed young lawyer who left home every morning. He may have been off to sell cheap neckties or magazines or vacuum cleaners or other door-to-door -door pandering in a remote neighborhood. Nearly 28% of the population was without any income at all, not including the 11 million farm families who, like mine, were suffering in their own way. Manchester notes that farms were getting less than 25 cents a bushel for wheat and seven cents for corn. Few could afford a $445 new Chevrolet or to build a $3,000 house. 10,000 banks closed. 175,000 school systems failed to open and millions more closed their doors in mid-year of 1933. Manchester, and he also was an author, as many of you know, of all the Kennedy books and of the uh, books about the great leader in Europe during World War II, Churchill, and he and I were fellow Marines on Okinawa. And when I invited him on one occasion to come to the university to give a commencement address, the school I called said he doesn't do that anymore, and he's down in uh, Key West writing the third volume of Churchill. So I said, well, do you have an address? He said, didn't have a phone number. So I dropped him a note. I said, from one old buck sergeant to another from Okinawa, I want you to give the commencement address. Within two days, he called me. Said, you get a fifth of Kentucky bourbon, 
And I come up on Saturday, and he'll tell sea stories, and I give a commencement address on Sunday if I'm still able. <laughs> so he did come, and uh, that's what Marines do for each other. He didn't make me drunk, but I helped him to get there. <laughs> Shortly after I was born, we moved back to Moody Lane in a recently constructed four-room house across the creek from the old log house where my parents had lived earlier. The house had no running water, just a deep well outside, a rain barrel to catch water from the roof. Of course, there was no central heat or electricity, all standard fare for farm families of that era. An outhouse was prominent in the backyard. And I remember the first time my parents told me that some people had the, their, that facility inside the house, I thought, my, my, how terrible must that be? In the Great Depression, breaking cold, the farm mortgage was foreclosed, and all of the families, including my mother's mother and the four small children, moved to Ballardsville, where my father would become a sharecropper in tobacco and a dairyman on the farm of Mr. Fleet Davis. This was not a bedroom community to Louisville as it is today, but a country town of one church, one store, an elementary school, and tenant houses for farmhands like my father. Included also were repair shops for farm machinery and trucks for hauling milk from dairies in the area to pasteurizing plants in Louisville. And I just recently spoke in Oldham County, which Ballardville is a part of, about three or four weeks ago, at the Oldham County Historical Society to the people I grew up with, most of them old now. Uh, these were the generations following those I grew up with. And I had a wonderful time and sold lots of books to folks who wanted to read about this strange fellow who lives in Richmond. Virginia says he came from here. <laughs> Today, tenant farmers and sharecroppers are often thought of as second-rate farmhands who settle for a demeaning role short of success of accomplishments, but that was not the case in those lean years. Anyone who supported his family was admired and highly regarded. It was called keeping the family out of the poorhouse. The elementary school just recently torn down, and when I was up there, they were taking the bricks out of that old building. Has the first eight grades, after which those who finished, though they were few and far between, were bused to the high school called Funk Seminary in LaGrange, Kentucky, the county seat, which later burned down with all of our records. Thus, I could claim to be a straight-A student, and no one would know the difference, except that I have inserted a photo of a report card of one of my high school academic years in the book. It tells the story of my despicable academic and deportment record. To my knowledge, I was the only Ballardsville student from my first grade, grade class to finish high school, though without enough credits to get in college. And by the way, I received the bulletin from the Old County Historical Society yesterday. It's got a full-page picture of me speaking there the other night with my sect, with my first grade teacher sitting by me. Oh. I 82, she 100, and her daughters brought her in, each holding an arm to hear me speak. And when I finished, she said, Bruce, you did good. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, many years later, I was turned down by Georgetown College for lack of an adequate record from high school. However, I had my revenge in that only seven years later, I could reflect on Psalm 118, the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone, and that I was the second highest paid employee as treasurer of the college that had turned me down. <laughs> and I found I could get in the various colleges through the back door and never could through the front door. Because Oldham County and educational programs are stellar today, most would cringe at the lack of reinforcement and support back then to lessen ambitious laggards whose farming demands were much more pressing even to their parents than educational opportunities and requirements or lack of such. It is recorded in my book for all to see, and you won't abide for this reason, <laughs> that I failed algebra twice in high school and received C's, D's, and F's in English and civics, and even typing in history, not to mention C's and D's and one F in deportment. I don't know what I did. I must have played the harmonica out loud. You might wonder how in the world I spent 54 years as a professor and administrator in higher education, over 40 years of those as a chancellor and president of a college and university. That, however, is the rest of the story. While the upbringing of my childhood created lasting values to guide my life, it was my years as a Marine that forged my future. On the first day of training, I revealed my insecurity and lack of confidence. The fact that had not been lost on me that all of my siblings had outperformed me in school. I knew no one was expecting me to do anything too extraordinary, least of all myself. Clear evidence of how I felt about myself prior to that interruption 
can be drawn from a letter I wrote to my mother dated June the 1st, 1944, shortly after I joined the Marines. Quote, we new recruits went up for classification and I signed up for avi aviation first choice and communication second. I think that I'll get one or the other and maybe I'll make something out of myself after all. I guess that'll be a surprise to you and dad if I do. <laughs> Having been considered scholastically less motivated and thus less apt to succeed than my siblings, I yearned to show my parents that I could rise above my shortcomings of the past. Lacking motivation or ambition, I had been a failure because I couldn't conceive of ever needing all of that book learning. In other letters written to my mother while a Marine, I alluded to my lack of interest in higher education. I noted that I might take a Marine Corps correspondence course because I didn't intend to attend college. In another, I referred to my two brothers going off to college, but declared, I can't see going to college and wasting two or three more years. I want to live my own way instead of trying to learn how to do something out of books. And even later I wrote, don't think too hard of me for not taking advantage of a good education. I've had all of that I can stand. <laughs> I guess the other two brothers will go to school some more, but I don't think that's for me. I was right and exceedingly responsive to the opportunities provided during my Marine Corps years. I worked hard to succeed at whatever challenge presented itself. The most important thing for me in getting through boot camp was to realize that if the guy next to me could do it, I could too. But you have to realize I was the smallest guy in boot camp. I was 130 pounds, which was the minimum to get in the Marine Corps then. I weighed uh, 5 feet 8 inches. Six months later in the Marine Corps, I'd grown 4 inches taller and gained 60 pounds. So I grew up in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Marine Corps training is intense, serious business designed to save lives in combat. The drill involved banded practice, grenade tossing, crawling on the ground under live fire, and long marches. Simply put, we learned how to kill. One Marine stated it well. The first day at camp, I was afraid that I was going to die. The next two weeks, my sole fear was that I wasn't going to die. <laughs> and after that, I knew that I would never die because I had become so hard that nothing could kill me. For my fellow Kentuckians, it would not be a surprise, and Burr hands at the Kentuckian, as is his lady, uh, uh, that on the rifle range, I exceeded quite well. Most have heard of Kentucky windage, and I used it to the greatest advantage. I followed instructions to the letter, and it paid off. With a score of 323 out of 340, I emerged from the day qualifying as an expert rifleman, one of the top three out of more than 550 men who fired for record. I had the highest score in my platoon, though I was among the youngest and smallest of the Marines in my outfit. Throughout the history of the Marine Corps, there has existed the reality that every Marine is a rifleman. Thus, my plane was fixed, and as the platoon's highest score, my picture was taken and submitted to my hometown newspaper, <laughs> the old of era, 64 years ago. This singular event in my life added to my self-worth, self-esteem, and self-confidence. I was somebody special in the eyes of my fellow Marines. My correspondence with my mother was a source of strength. With her, I could voice my apprehensions about the likely dangers ahead and about the dangers already around us. We were not eager to think about dying, but death became immediately real when in boot camp we lost a fellow recruit who drowned during swimming drills. Looming near with each phase of training were the Marine casualties in the Pacific as they continued to mount. And in those days, we went abroad in troop ships. And in boot camp, they said, you either learn to swim here or you'll die swimming after your ship goes down. So we tried hard. In one letter, I assured my mother that I would not forget the lessons of my childhood. I'm going to do my best to live up to what you and Dad have taught me, so there should be no need for you to worry about anything that might happen. And in my young mind, I worried about them if I got killed, how would they feel? These letters continued for the four years I served as a Marine, and my mother saved every one. Many of them are quoted in my book, and now they've all been put into the educational research wing of the Virginia War Memorial. And a good man to represent it here today from the Virginia War Memorial. Several college and university libraries requested them as valuable primary source material for on-the-scene perspectives of that time period. And they told me that today with emails, they won't have collections of letters like this saved from four years of writing to your mother. Among the things preserved in these letters is that on the day of our graduation from boot camp, we were reviewed by President Roosevelt. 
Since he was unable to walk, he rode in front of our platoon in his limousine with an open, open top. While there in San Diego, he announced publicly from a private train car that he intended to run for his third term as president. Following boot camp, we were assigned to various duties, many members of my platoon going to the invasion of Iwo Jima, where many were wounded and killed. Because of my success as a rifleman, they sent me off to gunnery school to be trained as a gunner and dive bombers. That may have saved my life as I avoided Iwo Jima to be later engaged in combat on Okinawa. Shortly after the war, when flying out of Iwo Jima, I narrowly escaped death that others received there by being involved in an airplane crash. So I, too, am an Iwo Jima survivor. Because my mother mailed the Oldham era to me, I kept up with happenings even related to military actions. On page 110 of my book, in a letter dated April 30, 1945, I wrote, I see where Pruitt got himself a jab on Iwo Jima. We were in boot camp at the same time. Then on May the 9th, I wrote, I see where Pruitt was wounded on Iwo Jima. Pruitt was a Kentuckian whose actions and mishap I learned about, not from the battlefield, but from the county newspaper back home. Although I wrote to my mother about my lack of interest in college, I continued to develop in the Marine Corps, not just physically, but emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, and every other way. And these experiences began to influence my life's choices. After serving two years in combat in the occupation of Japan, I re-enlisted for two more years, following which, after discharge, I decided to give college a try, while seeking to determine what possibilities existed for a life career. Because the Marine Corps had brought about a transformation in my thinking and the result had cast a positive light on my educational possibilities, I began to realize that I could choose a career which would depend upon academic and intellectual achievements. After you read in the book about life, religion, work, school, and growing up in Oldham County, you will follow me through my Marine Corps experiences to the unfolding of my educational ambitions to a PhD degree and a lifelong experience in higher education in four states, including coordinating the state system of higher education in the state of Tennessee. Beyond my growing up in Oldham County, spending four years in the Marine Corps and entering and completing college, I entered the field of higher education and continued to progress through toward what is to many thought of as the ultimate in challenge and opportunity, that of the college and university presidency. Never in my lifetime of 82 years have I been unbusy. Most of my business has employed either my body or my mind. If I were not physically active, I was engaged in the next action I would take. Thus, I have been seldom bored. In fact, the thing I most enjoy in life is being busy. That doesn't exclude those ordinary pleasures of family, friends, and avocations, for I have traveled more than most, covering 145 countries, most of it with family and friends and associates, both for business and for pleasure. Within the pages of my book, I have sought to convey and preserve what I believe to be the ambition within each of us to leave something of substance which may inure to the benefit of others. It is my hope that my children, grandchildren, and those who will continue my lineage through the ages to come and others beyond my family will read and learn from these accumulated experiences of my lifetime. In the introduction, I quote Ben Franklin, who said, if you would not be forgotten as soon as you're dead and rotten, either write things worth the reading or do things worth the writing. <laughs> In that spirit, on page 475 of my book, under the heading, Celebrating Success as I and others saw it, I quote Michael Corda, who said, success has always been easy to measure. It's the distance between one's origin and one's final achievements. Hopefully I've been able to share some achievements worth the reading and to suggest some personal values worth emulating. Thus, in my book, I share what to me are guidelines for an enjoyable, fulfilling, and successful life. For example, don't follow the crowd. Rather, follow the direction of your deepest instincts, religious, humanitarian, vocational, and professional. Acquire a good basic education as a minimum and add to that throughout life, both formally and informally. Life is an exercise in learning. Dream dreams and see visions and put them to the test of patience and perseverance so that life's journey will bring joy even if you shouldn't reach the summit of your goal. And there are many others filling two pages of my book with such reflections of what has made life worthwhile for me and added to my personal success and self-fulfillment. 
Because I did not meet high school graduation requirements, my path to successful adulthood, a rewarding career, and a fulfilling family life, while not altogether easy, has been exceedingly satisfying. In positions on college and university campuses, I have always been closely associated with young men and women, and thus feel special infamy for those who, like me, struggle to find their path. Perhaps my life's journey will be an inspiration to some who, like me, need to experience an educational transformation in attitude and in action, so as to take advantage of the opportunities not otherwise available. Although the interruption of World War II was a key influence in the rest of my life, it was neither the beginning nor the ending, merely a powerful interlude. Many factors, both before and after the war, bear heavily upon the air character of my accomplishments. Hopefully these memoirs convey much else that has been meaningful to me. I've never desired to disavow or to rise above my past, of which I'm proud. Rather, I have moved beyond that past to new and, for me, more relevant accomplishments based upon new understandings of opportunity. While we cannot change our roots, we can fertilize the soil in which we were planted. William Knox wrote, For we are the same our fathers have been. We see the same sights our fathers have seen. We drink the same stream and feel the same sun and run the same course our fathers have run. Thomas Arnold wrote, Two things we ought to learn from history. One, that we are not in ourselves superior to our fathers. Another, that we are shamefully and monstrously inferior to them if we do not advance beyond them. And throughout the book, I have cited good things that have been said over the years that I couldn't say any better, so I quoted somebody else. And I had a letter from a professor the other day who'd read my book saying, I'm glad to see that someone is deliberate enough to know that other people know more than he does. <laughs> As I wind down my summation of some of what is contained in the pages of my book, allow me to further confirm its content and whet your appetite for its reading by sharing excerpts from letters I have received from those who have read the book. From a resident of my home county back in Kentucky, truth and fiction can run down the same road, but in your life, Truth was more interesting than fiction. There are no words that say how I feel about so many of the things you wrote about. Is there a way to get more copies? Another conveyed, you made me realize that I can be a better person. I can achieve more and have more confidence in myself. From another who grew up in my home county, your book is hard to put down. You're not being too proud to put in it about your childhood it was very touching. Then written in quotes was, from humble beginnings. An author of several books writes, Your family life on the farm and values your parents invested in you certainly paid off richly. I found your journey so intriguing that I read the whole book in a few days. It's that long of a book, by the way. I have recommended it to our church library and many others. From a fellow Marine of World War II who's still living among the two million of us left from the 16 million of those days, reading your memoirs has enriched my opinions. It is of interest that there is much similarity in our youth. We both had the experience of the hard farm life, raising before, rising before sunup, milking cows and feeding the cattle and hogs before breakfast. From the wife of a deceased World War II Marine buddy that I was in combat with, I'm flattered that you sent me a book. I'm sorry that Wally isn't here to read it. You paint wonderful pictures and so much is familiar to me, even though I lived in the city and you lived on a farm. Your letters to your mother sound so much like Wally's to his. From a Marine Corps general who became a Marine after college, I have often thought how much better student I would have been had I entered the Marine Corps prior to entering college. Your book clearly documents how effective the Corps is in teaching teamwork, accountability, and core values. Rest assured, your book will always be a part of my small library of great books. A television commentator in Richmond said, I can tell this is one of those books I never want to finish because it's really like visiting family, people you love and sharing stories, laughter, and tears. From a class of 1944 at the university while I was president, whose diploma I signed, uh, I, read, I read with much curiosity and admiration your book and must admit that when I finished, I was exhausted for keeping up with the incredible journey and energy that greatly satisfied even more than I anticipated. My son Ryan, a 19-year-old, contemplates the Marine Corps and his parents worry. I came away with renewed confidence in my own leadership style and career aspirations having felt coached as I was reading. 
From the university, I remember your sincere hospitality at picnics at the president's home amid personable leaders with genuine values. Accept my heartfelt thanks for sharing your journey. From the head of the Center for Baptist Heritage in Virginia, you should be just as proud of the writing of your book. I have been recommending it to everyone. From a retired executive, I've just completed the reading of your delightful, inspiring autobiography. It was a Christmas present from my wife. Your story is fascinating. Your confessions were warm and candid. We are all so human. Your philosophy of leadership is instructive. The account of major positive changes to the university during your tenure is proof of your successful leadership and immeasurable contributions to the school so many of us love and appreciate and support. Thanks for adding joy to my life's journey. And from a friend in Chicago who is a publisher of many books, I spent the holiday with you. I just finished reading all 600 pages of your book. Everything about it's great. The poems, quotations, and photographs, everything. You're one of a kind. And from a hotel proprietor who purchased my book when I stayed overnight in Gallup, New Mexico, while riding my Harley across country in October. <laughs> and when I arrived, he said, you're a Marine, and therefore you don't have to pay for your stay overnight. The local veterans club's paying for it. Mm -hmm. Then he wrote, I have been really enjoying your book and can't wait to finish it so I can start it over again. I think that you get twice your money's worth. <laughs> so much for what others have said about the book, which is being marketed from coast to coast, especially in Marine Corps education other bookstores, such as the Oldham County Historical Society, the Virginia State Library, selected bookstores like Barnes & Noble's, several university bookstores, as I said, a lot of Marine bookstores. And finally, in highlighting the many verses, poems, and citations quoted through the book, I share one of Robert Frost's best, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged into yellow wood, and sorry I could not follow both, and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it been in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, but having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. But as that for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay and leaves no step in trodden black. Oh, I saved the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted that I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And I think in life, if you write your own book, you will begin to realize that you took a lot of roads less traveled by, and you went through a lot of doors that were open to you, and there were a lot of people out there opening those doors for you. And that's the essence of my book. I give credit to the little junior college that took me in when the University of Richmond wouldn't even take my application, I can assure you that, <laughs> or any other school I've been dean or president of. And that uh, family and friends and your background is, is everything in circumstances. Even a war can change your life. So that's my book, and there's more in it than that, and I hope some of you will enjoy reading it. I hope all of you will. And last Saturday, I autographed books at the Hog Rally. That's the Harley Riders Club. <laughs> and I want to tell you, I, I discovered that behind those leathers, there's a lot of interesting people. One of them came up to me and said, I'm impressed with the fact you're 82 and you're out here riding your motorcycle, you've got your leathers on and so forth. He said, I'm in the business of talking with older people. Would you come and speak to our group? He said, many younger than you have already, already quit living. And he said, I'm a PhD in psychology, and I work with these people trying to help them look younger, feel younger, and act younger. So maybe I'll go into the younger business. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy to respond to any questions. I hope I have at least opened your interest to a book, which I'm not really here to sell. I'm here to educate from it, and if you're interested in it, I want you to buy. By the way, that bunch of leathers out bought 15 books while I was sitting there. So, and all the rest, I said, we were selling so well out here, I wondered why I should even come in here and speak. <laughs> May I respond to any, and if not, we'll go autograph books. Now, you see, when uh, Marcus Weinstein applause. He's a graduate of the university. He's one of us. And his lady there has my name on her degree. And maybe twice. And in my book, I didn't know you were going to start the applause, but I had to open your picture. <laughs> Just like that.
you have the one of him on the motorcycle with you? That's right. I have him on the motorcycle with me, and my wife won't do it. <laughs> well, Dr. Hobb, we have just a little token of our appreciation for you being here today. Just a book about the uh, permanent collection here at the Library of Virginia. Uh, we thank you for your comments. And thank, thank you, joining you us so today. very much. And, and by coming here, I have come to know another spider. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we have our uh, our giveaway. I will uh, I will say we um, your book was so popular. We actually uh, have at this point, other than the one we're giving away here, we have one copy left. So, so you've done very well, and uh, really that, that woman in your home county of Kentucky may have uh, bought up all those extra copies. Well, I'll have to open my trunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, would you uh, would you do me the, the favor of drawing our crown uh, winner? Uh, well, please forgive me. The question is, do the, does the one who get it forgive me, or who don't? <laughs> I think I must say my final grandson. I knew you get a book. Well, congratulations. And uh, that's required required me. All right. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, Dr. Hunter will be out in the lobby and hope you'll come back and see us again. <laughs>